the uh, November, or excuse me, the October Natural Farming Meeting. Uh, today, th or this month, we have a special guest talking on black soldier flies. He's going to be doing uh, two presentations. The first presentation is on insect grubs and why to use them. And then the second part of the presentation, or he's going to do a separate second presentation, which will be on how to raise them uh, in, in different scenarios. So we're very excited to have this tonight. There's uh, several other natural farming announcements that um, have to, uh, and we'll be doing those at the um, at the intermission. And then, um, so we're very privileged to have Robert Olivier here um, to talk about black soldier flies. So um, I'd like to welcome him. So thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to thank a few people that have helped us to bring Robert Olivier here. I'd like to thank the, the County Research and Development Department for helping us solve some problems at our local slaughterhouses. And that's why Robert was brought in to try and look at how we can solve the waste management problem at some of the slaughterhouses here and also some of the egg, egg farms that we have large wastage out there. Um, Second thing is I'd like to thank Kaika from Dragon Eye Learning Center because she is the one that initiated the research for the University of Hawaii. And I'd also like to thank the University of Hawaii for letting us use their room. My boss back there is Russell Nagata. Thank, thank to him we can use this room. But uh, and I'd also like to thank one more person. Um, Where's Mindy? Right behind you. <laughs> Mindy is from Waikiki Worms. And if you guys make enough noise, she could be on our next speaker coming in from Honolulu to talk about composting worms. She is the expert on this, in this state on composting worms. So she would be a good speaker to come in and talk to you about how you can raise your compost worms. She also has some biopods for sale. So if you're interested in the biopod after you Listen to the seminar. Just come up and talk to Mindy, and she can show you how to set one up after Robert talks. And if you want one, you can carry it home with you tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Cook me out. Okay, Robert. Bob and Pony Show. Thanks, Mike. Hold on. Aloha. Aloha. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, okay. One sec. I need to talk. Is it better when I talk closer to the mic? Better? A little bit more. A little bit more, I guess. That's the best I can do here. Okay. That's it. Um, you gotta be close, Maybe lift the mic a little. I know. It's just comfortable. Let me try again. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. It's a real honor to be in Hawaii, as I think not only is Hawaii uh, one of the most richest states from a natural perspective I've ever seen, but also I believe that there is truly a frontier opportunity here that nobody else in the world is doing because of the unique perspective of uh, being an island and having to be sustainable versus choosing to be sustainable. So today I want to talk about why farming insects and then I should be fairly over soon and then the, la the second part is going to be a workshop demonstrating on how to farm insects using a biopod. So both segments are there. The first segment is going more into why I'm doing this and what I think this could mean for uh, you in Hawaii, especially chicken farmers, pig farmers. And then uh, the workshop is going to go a little bit more into the details. So anyway, I'm ready to start. So first question is first question. Why farm insects? Nobody farms insects, yet insects are an integral part of our food web. Um, there's no ecological system complete except the ones under and under deep ocean that do not rely upon insects to in some way uh, affect them. 
And so I kind of get this workshop going with a video to show what the most powerful decomposer is that I have found in my search today. And this, we're using larva to eat two fish. Now what's crazy about this is that we're looking into a decomposition. The fish on the left was completely raw. Fish on the right here has been cooked. If I look at that, I don't know in the back if you could see, this time lapse we're about three hours into the decomposition process. And so this is not composting, although on the web people call it grub composting. This truly is bioconversion. That means that what happens is that the proteins stay as proteins, the fats stay as fats. So by using insects, what nature does with the insects is she allows those nutrients not to be lost. If you look in nature, there's no compost piles in nature. No, not like we have it where we've got large dedicated spaces and we pile up m material. In, in, in nature you don't see that. The reason is is because compost doesn't stay that long because you have insects going at it. So in this presentation we're looking for a beneficial species of insect called the black soldier fly. Now here, what's amazing is, look at this. This was the cooked fish. All that is left is the, um, is the spine. That, the, you can see the tail here. You barely see the head. The cooked is a little bit stronger, still got the skin on it, but basically, I've seen these insects eat away alligator waste, all to the last, I would say, outer cell of the alligator skin. Now, we're about 20 hours into the decomposition process and they're running out of food. And you're now going to start seeing how they're ferociously looking for a new food source. So if nature does this for us, why work against them and use pesticides and insecticides and larvicides instead that we could work with them? So the trick on working with them is very, very simple. It's actually getting an understanding and appreciation for the organism. So what is it that we want to use as our input? We're really looking at uh, food waste uh, in particular, but it could be agricultural waste. Um, another very easy way to, you're going to see in this presentation is the whole notion that we can take slop and make chicken feed. And the reason that you can do that is by utilizing uh, the black soldier fly. So that's exactly what we're trying to do is take that food waste and slowly convert it, well, not slowly, you saw in 24 hours, into new grubs. Now, why is that so phenomenal? Well, it's phenomenal because in one square foot of grub composting, I can produce 35 pounds of protein a year. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you this way. An acre of soy produces about 350 pounds of protein a year. That's soy, that's planted. Acreage is not very abundant on the islands. So you, that's why in the islands you depend on the mainland is you need them to send you chicken feed, okay? If you can make that chicken feed on a small space, all you have to require is enough food waste to come in. So this one square foot can produce up to a tenth of an acre of protein, <coughs> of soy. That's phenomenal. So what does it make? Obviously it can feed the chickens, we go straight for fish, and we also look at the reptiles, but we're also able uh, to look into pigs, and I'll get into that later. So here's my slide. Why farm insects? Well, this is the uh, usable protein per acre of farmland. And you see here, this is soy. Sorry for guys in the back. It's probably the most productive at 356 pounds of protein per acre. Rice, corn, legumes. I feel like we need a slide in there with taro uh, just to kind of put it into an island perspective. But what we're really looking at is then using kind of like a beehive but for the black soldier fly in order to cultivate them. So that's a design of a new commercial biopod that we're bringing out for the island. And so what that does is it starts changing the equation dramatically. So if I connect the biopod to uh, agriculture, then you're seeing that on this model, I'm at 414 pounds of protein a year, up to at least. 
given what? Enough food waste. We're not making protein out of nothing here. We need an input, and that would be the protein. So, now, over. Oh, hello? We're feeding that biopod. About to get to that. Hold on. No, as well. There we go. You're back. So, okay, there we go. Now I'm going to stand back a little bit. Um, so, what are we looking at? Is this 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 biopod design that I have in mind for the islands would produce about 414 pounds of protein, and in order to get it, we need about seven and a half tons of waste. So it doesn't fit on the page, I'm sorry. Um, and that requires about a 20 square foot digestible surface area. Now, this number is not based on food waste. This is based on a project that Mike asked me to do is look at the possibilities of using slaughterhouse waste. And there's a, a few digestibility factors that I took into account. Um, but if you've got really good quality slop, that's gonna go up even more. So, again, why are we farming insects? We're farming insects because we can replace acres of production on a very, very, very small scale. That's why I think that rainforest ecologies, uh, you, you know, the, the funny thing is, is you go to Kauai, there's chickens in abundance, okay? Yet we can't maintain a profitable chicken operation on the islands. It just doesn't make any sense. So you have to start thinking like an ecosystem. And so farming of that nature takes a lot of sense. Also, another reason that we need to find a use for our food waste is what I call the principle of the carbon food print. Okay? What you'll notice is that we have dramatically increased our carbon, product, our carbon impact and from an island perspective, it's not just a carbon impact. Oh, we started eating so many more calories. Uh, now we're eating up to 1,400 calories per person a day. About 40% of that is actually wasted. And most of it is still originated on uh, the consumer. 60% of it is originated with the consumer. And if we actually were more efficient with our food waste, a quarter of our oil and about we could, a quarter of our oil production could be reduced or take about 300 million cars off the road. Now, what does that mean for Hawaii? It's not about just carbon. Uh, everybody talks about trying to be carbon neutral and everything like that. In Hawaii, it's even more than that. It's talking about money. Every time that you got to bring a feed from the mainland, yes, the carbon footprint's huge. But it's not only that. The cost of the feed goes up by 2 or 3%. So grub composting is really an, a notion of recuperating or bioconverting our food, our, our proteins from our waste back into feed. And see, ultimately, if we would eat all our food waste, I guess that would be the best reduction of our food problem. But that doesn't happen. And going to landfill and incineration gives little to no value for that food waste at the end of the day. So I've settled with feeding animals as the second option of what we can do with our food waste. So nutrient cycling, if you really start thinking, farmers need to start thinking as ecologists. And you need to take into consideration that every good ecosystem has three main ingredients. You have a plant, an animal, and a decomposer. Today, we only have in our agriculture system plants and animals. That means that we've got a third unwanted factor called waste. And without something that can eat that waste quickly, like you saw in the video, our agriculture is kind of grinding to its limits. Um, you can't be as productive as a rainforest without a decomposer. So the species that we're looking into is called Hermitia illicens. And I'm going to go in the second part of the workshop, I'm going to go a lot more into the detail of how we use the black soldier fly. Um, so the life cycle is going, I'm just briefly touching upon it right now. But the main cycle is obviously, everybody thinks when they hear fly, they say, oh, it's a fly. Well, this is what the adult looks like. I don't know if you've seen it. It is black. Uh, very wide, mostly in your canopy. What's amazing about it is that the real cycle of this animal um, 
is the larva stage. So, sorry. So the main points are is that they're not a disease vector. And this is the reason that we utilize this species over and against any other species. Another reason why this species is really interesting is that its main life cycle, its longest uh, period that it's alive, it's as a grub. And then another thing is, you see that flying adult there? It doesn't have a mouth part. So the only, again, the only stage of the animal that eats is the grub stage. And here's the grub stage, which many of you who compost have probably noticed that sometimes you get these black soldier fly larvae in your compost. Well, these guys live from two weeks to three months. This is the main life cycle of the organism. The eggs, only four days. The adult, just long enough to lay its eggs. Remember, he's got no mouth parts. So for the women in the audience, you can imagine what it would be like is to live your entire existence without eating and yet having the responsibility to get pregnant and lay those eggs. <laughs> so from that, when you go from grub to pupa, that's about a total of 14-day process. In that process the larva actually loses its mouth part. It actually secretes its entire digestive system. And then what it wants to do is it wants to leave the pile of waste that it was so happily eating away in. Also at that point, because the insect no longer will eat, guess what has to happen? It has to build up a huge arsenal of two very, 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 very val valuable um, substances, fats and proteins. So when the larva wants to auto-migrate out of the waste that it's eating, it's actually at its fattest. Because from that point on, it's got to complete its reproductive cycle without ever eating again. So we harvest only the larva. So we don't let the flies go out in nature and propagate. Even if they did, they're a non-disease vector. The flying adult only touches waste when she's about to lay her eggs. Unlike housefly, housefly goes from one waste pile to the next waste pile to the next waste pile, and guess what? Now some disease got spread, correct? Here, the female only visits waste once, she lays her eggs, and she dies. And then for, they're not considered a disease vector, and that's very important. So this grub that we harvest right when it leaves the colony What's so amazing about it? Well, what's amazing, it's got a lot of nutrients. If I quickly dehydrate the grub, what I got is I got a grub meal that's 42% fat. Anybody that has chickens knows right off the bat that that is a tremendous amount of energy reserve. I kind of look at the grub as nature's you know, candy bar, or power bar. Um, and the, the reason is, is that all of the nutrients that you get out of the organism are really coming from the waste, but very, very, very condensed. And that's exactly why we like them. The protein level is off the charts, guys, 34% protein. And I've seen numbers all the way up to 45%. It depends of what they were eating, okay? So if you've got up to 45% protein, guess what you got? you can easily, easily, easily start making an all-island feed. So nature's power bar, mix it in with the rest of the meal, and hopefully uh, we have some happy chickens at the end of the day. Uh, they got a lot of shells, so they got a good fiber. In this particular feed that we made, we had about another 7% moisture left, so we didn't go to completion. But the, the feed had a good shelf life, so that's what we stuck with. Um, also an important point for guys that are wanting to lay eggs is that dehydrated grub is 5% calcium. So if you're laying eggs and you need a source of calcium, you got it right here. Also, you're looking at a phosphorus ratio of 1.5%. See, many times when we look, we look at some nutritional value, we see calcium and it says 40 ppm, 50 ppm. Well, 5% is 5,000 ppm. So that's pretty high. And again, there are friends, happy chickens, happy fish, because we can also use this in aquaponics settings and all kinds of other animals. So 
Anybody have an idea what a harvest looks like? So yeah, we got these biopods. This is a small version. We got larger one outside, and I think we're about to go look at it. Um, or it's going to be hard to evacuate, maybe at the break. But this is what it looks like. And so what you're seeing is live grubs that have self-harvested. They change color. They don't longer have a mouth part and they're completely safe to the touch. Also, one thing that they do is they produce kind of a natural antibiotic. They self-clean themselves before they pupate. Why would they do that? For us, no. They do that because they're biochemically going into a very, very sensitive period of their lives. They're gonna change, they're gonna grow wings, they're gonna grow legs, they're gonna grow everything. And so for that stage, you really they, they really clean themselves pretty well. So that's the only part that we harvest. So. Uh, people have to understand that we're not creating a ton of flies here. This is what we're going to use to feed animals. Just to kind of go over the basics, if I've got 100 pounds of food waste, what I can get out, I can get out about 20 pounds of grubs. And then I've got very, very, very little residue left, about 5 pounds. So, wait, this doesn't add up. 125. Where's the rest, right? Well, what happens is most of, of our food waste is pure moisture, uh, easily 80%. So when I look at that, then utilize it, that moisture gets evaporated, and all we've got left is a very, very concentrated end user. So if I use other materials like cow manure, what you notice is the main difference is that 100 pounds of cow manure is going to give me 25 pounds of compost. Why that much? The food waste is only 5%. The reason is, is that material is not as digestible. Uh, the cow couldn't digest it. The grub has a harder time with it, so there's more residue that's left. Also, you'll notice is that the, that the yield of the grubs went down. Why did that yield go down? Because cow manure has a lot less crude protein in it than food waste. So the amount of crude protein that can actually be utilized in the process is important. Now, other materials that can be used, for example, fish waste. Um, we're looking into papaya. We're looking into a whole bunch of all island ingredients to feed these colonies so that we can actually harvest an insect. Now remember this, there's not one Cargill in the world that sells an insect-based animal feed. Okay? So what, what we're really doing, it, it, this is the funniest story, when we first discovered this organism in Texas, we went to Texas A&M and said, identify this, it's eating everything in our compost bin, what is it, come back to us, identify the species, and give me all the literature that you have. They did that, with my, my, that was my dad's request back in 1998. They came back and they said, yeah, it's Hermitia illicens, it's black soldier fly, and there's only two papers ever written about them. <laughs> and guess what those papers were about? How to kill them. Okay? So the whole notion that we can use a whole variety of waste, we can use food waste, we can use manure, we can use slop, we can use fish waste, we can use agricultural waste. See, that's how nature makes sure that there's no waste, is she utilizes every part of it, and she doesn't take it down to the smallest, you know, um, molecule like methane gas or CO2. No, she, she actually keeps it as valuable proteins and fats. So from an agro-economical perspective, we should be aiming for something just like that. So the wonderful part about fish waste, if I take fish waste in, we did research, and we found that, well, we didn't do it, but Sophie St. Hilaire did, sorry about that, and she found out that if she put omega-3 rich fish waste in the compost piles with the grubs, that the grubs were full of omega-3s. What I think is exciting for the chicken guys is that if you feed a colony of insects with fish waste, then you've got grubs rich in omega-3s. I then feed those omega-3 rich grubs to your chickens, guess what? You're going to start getting omega-3 rich eggs, just like the big um, you know, Tyson and all these other guys are promoting that they've got all kinds of health benefits with their food. Actually, if, it, if a chicken just ate insect, then she probably gets what she needs. 
thinking of the chicken, we let's think about what is it that the prairie chicken used to eat before there was soy meal and everything else on the market? What was the natural diet of the prairie chicken? Well, a third insects, a third grains, and a third leafy greens. It's that one third insect that if you've ever seen, this is the funny part. When I harvest my insects and I go near some chickens that have been accustomed to this bucket, it's like, I'm not kidding you, it's like a Metallica concert. I mean, those ladies are not ladies anymore. They know that this is exactly what they want. And granted, I've seen, I've seen chickens eat everything, okay? They're really not picky if it comes to what they do. But they definitely have a, a preference for something that crawls and is just kind of shortly looking at them. And I mean, they peck really quick. So again, this whole notion that insects can bioaccumulate valuable nutrients like omega-3s, I think that's really starting to think like, like nature does. You see, 10 years ago, the only pa papers on these species were how to kill them. And now we're finding out that actually insects are great ways to bioaccumulate nutrients into ways that can actually be very economical. So we need to bring chickens back. And this is a picture from a biopod customer in Oahu. Right, Mindy? Yep. And here she's got her chicken coop. And she's providing the shade for the biopod because these things can't get too hot. they got to vent pretty well. And so what happens is the, here's the little lid. Food waste goes in. Grubs go up the ramp. And then what happens is you've got an automatic feeder right there going straight for the chickens. So why farm insects? I tell you this, because chickens really like to eat them. <laughs> then another aspect about what we need to think about, especially looking as Hawaii is so in tune with their oceans and their water, is protecting fish. I, there's an ever more we're starting to feed the world with farm-raised fish, which is wonderful. However, there's a dark side to that story is that for every pound of farm-raised fish, you require about six pounds of oceanic fish. Now, granted that the oceanic fish are kind of the lower fish on the food chain. They're not as you know, valuable as what we like to eat from an ocean. But we're still depleting the oceans at an astronomical scale. If you look at the price of fish meal versus soy meal, you'll notice is that the, it's the fish meal that is becoming more and more expensive quicker and quicker. So what we've been doing is we've been doing all kinds of experiments. Um, I work with Will Allen at Growing Power, and we're trying to feed his fish up in Milwaukee with a grub supplement. And Sophie St. Hilaire had done tests on rainbow trout. And what she's found out is that we can easily replace, off those six pounds of oceanic fish requirement for a farm-raised rainbow trout, we can replace three pounds with insect. And there's no taste difference. There's no um, difference in the weight gain. Once fish don't eat 100% insect meal, so at that point they still do, I would say, um, lose a little... You know, they're not as efficient, but up to 50% is a huge sustainable uh, improvement. And so the only thing that I have to point out is that if you've got a fish farm, and this happens a lot, is a lot of the fish farmers, they process their fish waste too. So they immediately would have the tendency to do what? Use a few biopods, put all their fish waste in there, produce guess what, protein-rich fish feed, and then feed it back to it. And so one of the principles about insect farming that's very important is that we don't feed back to your own species uh, its own waste. And so I just need to point that out. A lot of people think that this is suddenly a miracle cure and they're going to take all their chicken manure and feed it straight back to their chickens in the form of insects. I highly advise against that. However, if you were to buy a feed of chickens that are fed with insects that, that themselves ate a lot of fish, 
then guess what? You got an omega-3 insect feed, and that's exactly what your chickens want, and that's a lot safer. Uh, here in Dallas, we were. Uh, this is an aquaponics operation, and we're actually feeding the tilapia on grub and uh, other plant residues, and that's working. Just to show you that it's not just me talking these days, um, this is Sophie St. Hilaire taste test on rainbow trout, and it works. And so that's where she's showing they blindfolded a few people and they made them taste, you know, a grub balanced fish. Uh, a, fed, a fish fed with grubs versus a controlled fish, and you're noticing there was no discernible taste difference up to 50%, and that's really important for the bigger agriculture industries. So the pigs love, um, they love live grubs. You remember those grubs I showed you a little earlier? So I don't know if this will work, but here you go. That brings us to our next point. Why farm insects? Um, Mike did the research. We took a prote protein analysis of the black soldier fly and looked at the feed requirements uh, for actually uh, raising pigs. They matched each category with flying colors. All the proteins lined up uh, very significantly, especially the lysine, which is extremely important. And so you're also noticing that in nature, what do pigs and hogs do? They like to root for insects. So that natural reaction that you're seeing from the pig completely, it, it, it's biomimicry at its best. So that's another reason why I think we need to start farming insects. And I know Hawaiians love their pigs, so that's not an issue. And then another aspect is, is that we've noticed is that the fertilizer that's left, um, I'm just making a brief note of that, is um, works very, very well for growing orchids. Uh, again, why, I don't fully understand, but it kind of makes sense. An orchid uh, feeds on detritus. Uh, this is the leftovers from a composting process, so there seems to be a natural uh, correlation there. And so our, my notion is, is that what we need to start looking in is in ways to farm insects. And the most appropriate way to do that is to start thinking of creating barns on the level of an insect. See, when we create a barn for a cattle, it's a big structure. If we do it for sheep, it's maybe a little smaller. You know, a dog house is a little bigger than a cat house, you see? So as the animal gets smaller, in order to manage it efficiently, you don't need some, you don't need a large infrastructure. So my notion of a of an insect farm is kind of like a bee farm. It's to create these pods that can be put on a pallet and what they do is you put your food waste in and when the insect is ready to migrate she goes into a collection bucket. And so that's probably one of the, mo the biggest advantages over worms is that there's this auto harvesting process that takes place. See, don't get me wrong, I love red worms. I love using worms. Mindy knows this. But to me, they're, they're stars at being soil builders. When it go, comes to bioconversion and going after fats and proteins, you know, they eat meats, they eat dairy, they, they, they don't shy away from slaughterhouse waste. They go after all, you know, the guts of, of what we throw away. These guys are superior. That, that's how they're real bioconverters. So the whole notion is, is a few years ago we started developing the first biopods. Uh, this is a second generation residential unit. It's got lots of improvements on it. When we then look at the, the whole concept of insect farming, what I envision is putting out fields of these units. And the wonderful part is each, field, each unit has all of the necessary requirements for a happy colony. And so now the trick is to find a waste source right next to it. So that means that we don't need a centralized facility. We can many a times go right on site, be it a farm, be it a uh, food distributor, be it an agricultural producer. And so insect farming, in a way, uh, can bring a lot of our producers back in touch on how to 
also think or keep in mind how to handle their waste products. And so another aspect about it is we probably have to mechanize it a little bit, but is to kind of come up with some agricultural tools like um, side feeders that would, you know, this is a, this is a lime spreader, but I imagine using a portable hopper like this so that we can feed an entire row so that you can actually scale this up really, really quick, really fast. Here is a process that we did in Texas, and we were have in Texas we've got winter, okay, and so we in winter time the species gets a little bit dormant, and so in commercial operation that's the Achilles heel, and you need to make sure that you don't use lose the life cycle and the egg laying that goes on through winter because the adults just like bees don't want to fly around in winter time, and so. What happens here is we have we can maintain them inside um, a greenhouse, and we did this for over 18 months, and that's how we got all of our numbers. And so, this is where you see how we put in a ground food waste, and notice this black stuff. Anybody know what that black stuff is? Yesterday's food waste. Okay, that, and I think that's very important. There you see them crawling out. That's one day harvest right there. Think how many chickens that would feed. Especially if you look at a one third, one third, one third ratio. Now you can mix this with other island based feeds that are protein poor, but now you've got nature's candy bar right there. So, so anyway, the, my point is why, why farm insects? It's a matter of a sustainable vision. We need to protect the land. That means, hold on one sec, zero food waste is a means to landfill diversion. We also, because we take care of our slaughterhouse waste and other waste streams that are very putrescent, we can protect our watersheds from agricultural runoff. We not only protect the land, we also feed the land. We provide a compost and, and pig, chicken, and fish feed becomes independent of the price of oil. I think that's very important. And then we also feed people. But we don't feed people grubs, no. <laughs> to me, it's very simple. Green jobs come down to one thing, is you can't outsource self-reliance. And that's why I believe that all of these factors together are very important for Hawaii. And so, ultimately, when Mike asked me to be here, he said, can we do something with our slaughterhouse waste? Because if we save the slaughterhouses, we can protect the beef industry and not send everything off to the mainland all the time. So that concludes my first portion of why we farm insects. And on the second half, I'd like to go over uh, more of the details on how you can actually do that. Um, but I don't know how much light we have left, but I've got a large biopod outside that for the last two weeks I've gotten going, and there's a ton of grubs in there, but there's a lot of you guys. So, Mike, do you have any suggestions how we're going to do this? <laughs> is there enough light? Okay. So, this is a moment to stand up, come see some grubs, and then in 15 minutes we'll start the second section.